presentation tonight. I know it is a little bit of a change of venue for those of you who come regularly, so thank you very much and coming out on such a cold and blustery night. My name is Nadine Collins and I'm the Advancement Officer here at St. Jerome's and welcome to the third lecture in the 2011-12 lecture series in Catholic experience here at St. Jerome's. This lecture series is uh, one of the five programs run by the Center for Responsible Citizenship. Through this series, we strive to provide free public lectures on a variety of topics of interest to members of all different faiths, addressing issues relevant to faith in today's world. We're able to provide these lectures thanks to the generosity of our donors. Tonight's lecture is a very special one because it's the very first Lawrence A. Cummings Lecture on Cultural History. This lecture was endowed by Roger Spaulding, who was a student of Dr. Lawrence Cummings. And Dr. Cummings was originally a medievalist. He was a faculty member at St. Jerome's from 1961 to 1971. And he's fondly remembered for his very demanding teaching style, which many people benefited from. And uh, starting the St. Athwal's Players, which produced annual medieval plays. And many people participated and had wonderful memories of that time. He went on from St. Jerome's to uh, work in the School of Architecture at the University of Waterloo. And he established the cultural history courses there, which are credited as giving the school its very unique nature, which it uh, maintains today. Um, he was the mind behind the idea that architecture was a form of cultural expression inextricably linked to literature, history, philosophy, language, music, and even sport. Dr. Cummings was known for making ideas live and drawing extraordinary connections. He retired in 1995 and sadly passed away in June 2010, but his contributions across campus live on and are celebrated by many of the students who he was taught by. And tonight, we hope, is a wonderful uh, memory to him. So it's fitting, uh, given tonight's topic, that uh, we did relocate to this, uh, to this venue, and I hope you do enjoy it. So without further ado, I would like to invite up uh, Reverend Con O'Mahony to introduce uh, our speaker this evening. He's a St. Jerome's board member and the priest at St. Michael's Parish here in Waterloo. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just listening to the... Um, um, the context for the uh, funding for the lecture this evening, uh, we're in for a treat. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonder, it's, it's very fortuitous that we would have Michael here. Uh, Michael Madden was raised in Goderich, Ontario, and graduated uh, from Ryerson University School of Interior Design. Um, he has worked as a set designer in, feature film, in the feature film industry since 1995 on such productions as Good Will Hunting, uh, Blade II, Cinderella Man, Assassination of Jesse James, which nobody has seen and is one of my favorite movies. It's a beautiful, wonderful book. Uh, the Incredible Hulk, and most recently, A Dangerous Method. Uh, from 2000 to 2002, he was the art director for World Youth Day, uh, and in, in which, was, of course, was in Toronto uh, with Pope John Paul II, and is at, and is at present uh, completing a master's in, of art in religion with a visual arts co uh, concentration at the Institute for Sacred Music at Yale Divinity School in New Haven, uh, Connecticut. We had the pleasure of spending... Um, sometime this evening at dinner uh, with, um, with Michael and learned a little bit about his, um, his uh, career in, in film. Um, and his passion, though, for uh, the world of, of um, liturgy and the liturgical arts uh, shines through in, in so many things. At St. Michael's Parish, we are delighted that uh, when he has completed his studies, uh, he will be assisting us with some design uh, work for our uh, church. Michael. Good evening, everyone. And I hope everyone can hear me. Okay. Uh, I'm just thinking about the uh, sports component in that summary of, and I can only think of Jesuits and uh, their uh, take on liturgy as being a contact sport. So, <laughs> <coughs> so 
So a uh, heartfelt thank you to St. Jerome's and in particular to Father David Perrin for the kind invitation to offer this evening's Lawrence A. Cummings Lecture on Cultural History. And uh, thank you in a special way to Roger Spaulding for uh, endowing the lecture series. Um, I would like to give you a bit of background about why uh, I'm discussing the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels this evening and introduce you to some of the players uh, involved in the realization of this cathedral. And I probably should ask how many of you might have been to LA and actually been to the cathedral. So we have, the rest of you need to get out more. <laughs> A few years ago, I was reading Thomas Merton's The Sign of Jonas and uh, I came across the following paragraph. For 150 years, men have been building churches as if a church could not belong to our time. The church has to look as if it were left over from some other age. I think that such an assumption is based on an implicit confession of atheism, as if God did not belong to all ages and as if religion were only a pleasant, necessary social formality preserved from past times in order to give our society an air of respectability. Uh, I found that quite a provocative, and it, 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 if you've read that book, it kind of comes out of left field. It's kind of one paragraph midway through the book. Uh, contemporary Christian communities continue to build new houses of worship or to reorganize and refurbish existing ones. And within the Roman Catholic building tradition, church people can articulate what is required uh, most often theologically, uh, while architects and designers interpret and concretize these requirements uh, in built form. Too often, worshiping communities and individuals from traditions, especially the Catholic, with an overwhelming artistic patrimony of the figural are left to navigate and inhabit worship spaces that reflect a predominant architectural aesthetic language of formal abstraction. On the one hand, these projects are impoverished by church people who refuse to engage with any form of the visual, visual arts disciplines outside their comfort zone, and by church communities with increasingly large numbers of people disconnected from the Christian narrative and its symbols. The visual narrative that has informed most Catholic Christians has been minimized or abstracted in modern projects and has left many nostalgic for that past narrative in the midst of a perceived visual vacuum. On the other hand, architects respond that to do otherwise is, as Kenneth Frampton says, regress into nostalgic historicism or the glibly decorative. And yet, I think this is an inadequate and unproductive response to ecclesial communities as the architect retreats from design projects that challenge his or her comfort zone of architectural discourse. Each party then assumes that the other will compensate for the gap in their respective understanding of the religious building type. In the process, church people and architects have, I think, uh, drifted apart and forgotten a language that each once shared. My concern is that with this loss of a shared language, significant contemporary cont contributions to the long continuum of Christian architecture are being dismissed as anomalies or ruptures within that tradition. And I'm thinking of a, 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 an immediate or recent example of such a dismissal uh, that was reported on in November by Andrea Tornelli, who's a kind of a Vaticanista, uh, talking about uh, the Vatican establishing a new liturgical art and sacred music commission uh, out of the Congregation for Divine Worship. And this team has been set up to put a stop to what is described as garage-style churches, boldly shaped structures that risk denaturing modern places for Catholic worship. And uh, quoting the, uh, the cardinal uh, that uh, leads us to dicastery, the reality is staring everyone in the eyes. In recent decades, churches have, substituted, uh, have been substituted by buildings that resemble multi-purpose halls. 
Too often architects, even the more famous ones, do not use the Catholic liturgy as a starting point and thus end up producing avant-garde constructions that look anything uh, like anything but a church. These buildings composed of cement cubes, glass boxes, crazy shapes, and confused spaces remind people of anything but the mystery and sacredness of a church. Tabernacles are semi-hidden, leading faithful on a real treasure hunt, and sacred images are almost non-existent. Despite this description's obvious allusions, I think, to the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels, the LA, LA Cathedral has captured the attention not only of the local community, but also the wider Catholic Church in the U.S. and abroad, as well as the international architectural community with its theme of an interdisciplinary significance and in the process has achieved iconic status. And I just want to uh, introduce you to three players that were critical in, in the realization of the, um, of the cathedral. And the first of that would be the city of Los Angeles itself. Um, in the early mornings of January 17, 1994, uh, the Northridge uh, earthquake struck with St. Vibiana's Cathedral in downtown Los Angeles sustaining heavy damage. And this is the, um, sorry, this is the current, uh, this is as of October, um, and the space has uh, been de-consecrated uh, and is now a uh, multi-purpose facility. Uh, and this is the interior. I just happened to be walking by and they were doing a setup for uh, some audiovisual presentation. The extent of the damage to the cathedral precipitated the decision of the archdiocese to pursue the construction of a new cathedral, which was then uh, named Our Lady of the Angels. And I just want to situate the cathedral, the new cathedral now, within the, the urban context, if you like. So here's downtown uh, LA up in the upper right, the airport down in the bottom left. And this is uh, the area of the downtown uh, referred to as Bunker Hill. And this would be the Hollywood uh, freeway that's running across, uh, alongside. The Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels is located in this block here. Uh, there, I didn't need to do that. And it's uh, located on what's often referred to as a cultural axis of Grand Ave. So there's a number of theaters and uh, opera houses. It's like the uh, equivalent of New York's uh, Lincoln Center. And then there's the Walt Disney uh, Concert Hall by Frank Gehry. And uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art is there. So here's basically the photograph of the downtown. There's the Hollywood Freeway. Here's the Our Lady of the Angels Cathedral, and then these three um, th uh, theater and opera house and what, and then uh, the Disney Hall by Gary, and then the uh, the Museum of uh, of Modern Art or Contemporary Art. Um, and the cathedral was seen as is seen as an urban monument with its prominent placement within the city on Bunker Hill, its relationship to the Hollywood Freeway, and its location along the cultural axis of Grand Avenue. Uh, in 1996, Mayor Richard Riordan recognized the cathedral as a centerpiece for the revitalization of the historic core of the city. Uh, Ira Yellen, a well-known developer in the downtown responsible for the restoration of Grand Central Market and a local champion, a champion of downtown Los Angeles, commented on the importance of the cathedral to the city. When you look back to the history of civilization, the building of cathedrals has usually defined what a city is all about. The spaces around great cathedrals are some of the great spaces of urban civilization. We have the opportunity to model and create that here. The decision of the cardinal to build the permanent cathedral of the archdiocese in the art, old historic core is an extraordinarily important one. In that one act, I believe he has done more to give a future to all the buildings in the historic core than all of us working all these years. Uh, so I just want to give you a sense from uh, the Walt Disney Center by Gary walking up towards the cathedral on the street level. So we're going to be, uh, this is Frank Gary, of course, and this is his uh, concert hall that was done in 2003. So now we're going to walk up Grand Ave towards the cathedral. 
And there's the uh, campanile of the cathedral. And so as we walk, walk along Grand Ave, we're at the, uh, at the cathedral. Uh, and uh, Raphael Mineo uh, was a finalist. Uh, Frank Gehry was a finalist. And then Tom Main uh, was also a finalist. Uh, this is a, a building downtown, not that far from the cathedral. And you may uh, be familiar with uh, his graduate housing at uh, U of T. And now to the patron, Cardinal Roger Mahoney and the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. As the largest diocese in the United States, numbering almost 5 million Catholics, 287 parishes, and comprising almost 40% of the population of Los Angeles, the Archdiocese wields considerable influence over the life of the American Catholic Church. Under Mahoney, the Archdiocese has become an international leader in catechetical formation and is renowned for its religious education congress, which will be actually taking place in two weeks, which attracts over 35,000 participants each year. And uh, maybe some of you have even attended, I don't know. Um, the Cardinal has also been an effective local and national leader advocating immigration reform. In 1997, um, sorry, before I get to that, this was just uh, a photo of him in the fall uh, celebrating Eucharist along the uh, U.S.-Mexican border. Uh, in 1997, to prepare the Archdiocese to celebrate the new millennium, he wrote, Gather Faithfully Together, a guide for Sunday Mass, and produced an accompanying video. And the goal was to improve the quality and standard of the liturgy, and of the assembly's participation in the celebration of Sunday Eucharist in every parish. And some of you might recall uh, Mother Angelica, uh, head of the Eternal Word Network Television, um, or Television Network, was compelled to issue an unequivocal apology to Cardinal Mahoney for suggesting on the air that uh, gather faithfully together a guide for Sunday Mass in this uh, publication, the Cardinal had denied the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist and for calling on members of his archdiocese to disobey him. Um, now to our architect, uh, Raphael Mineo, is recognized within the international architectural community as a prominent scholar and teacher committed to furthering architect architectural discourse. He has taught at Princeton, was the first uh, Joseph Louis Sert Professor of Architecture at Harvard and former chairman of Harvard Graduate School of Design from 1985 to 1990. Um, just before Cardinal Mahoney announced in 1996 that Mineo's submission had been selected as the winning design for the cathedral, Mineo had been awarded the Pritzker Prize in Architecture, the equivalent of the Nobel Peace Prize. And here are a few images of work um, this is a uh, town hall, and directly opposite is this grand cathedral. So it has to negotiate this public space. Uh, I think it does a beautiful job. Uh, this is a train station uh, in Madrid, and uh, another as uh, component of that same station. One need only Google Rafael Mineo to see that the cathedral remains a signature piece within his architectural oeuvre. Within the context of the cathedral's design process, and I think this is important, he poignantly identified the risk the architect faced. And I'm quoting him here. The architecture of the Middle Ages, reflecting the homogeneous society of its time, never questioned that, a building, or that in building a church or a cathedral was raising the house of God. But during the Renaissance, religion became an individual private matter. From the 16th century on, Christians showed more concern for the pursuit of individual fulfillment than for structuring society. Since then, we have abandoned the idea of a building that, trying through its perfection to be a reflection of God, can be offered as the seat of the church. What are the architectural implications of this shift from an understanding of the world as the civitas dei to a perception of religion as an individual private matter? This change implies that an architect of a church cannot appeal to society as a whole, but rather quite the opposite. Society is actually asking the architect to take the risk of offering others his vision of what constitutes a sacred space. 
So we'll now turn to the, uh, the matter, at, matter at hand. Our Lady of the Angels, Cathedral, Urbanism, Phenomenology, and the Sacred. <clears throat> September 2nd, 2012, will mark the 10th anniversary of the dedication and consecration of the much celebrated Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels in Los Angeles, California. It is significant that no other recent ecclesiastical building has been so thoroughly disseminated and critiqued, even castigated, by people from very different points of view and disciplines. Much has been made of and written about the Cathedral's relationship and contribution to the urban fabric of the city. The patron, Cardinal Roger Mahoney, and the cathedral's potential impact upon the American Catholic Church, and the architect, Raphael Mineo, and the cathedral's significance for the discipline of architecture. These three agents together, the city, the patron, and the architect, constituted a triad, a crucible, out of which the cathedral emerged. The stakes were high for each of these agents and their respective constituencies, with local, national, and international reputations at risk. At greater risk, perhaps, was and is the credibility of a phenomenological claim made not only by those within church circles, but by those within the disciplines of philosophy, history, and architecture which asserts an enduring need and role for sacred architecture as a bearer of meaning within the urban context, even as contemporary culture ostensibly seeks what Kenneth Frampton refers to as secularized spirituality. Phenomenology is understood here as an openness not only to the realm of all the senses, but also the potential revelation of some form of symbolic truth where space is perceived not as abstract or neutral, but as the space of lived experience, where the human body's physicality or corporeality is acknowledged when addressing the experience of space. Karsten Harries is a contemporary philosopher who is particularly concerned with the relationship between architecture, aesthetics, secular culture, phenomenology, and the sacred. In his essay, Untimely Meditations on the Need for Sacred Architecture, Harries insists on the continued need for sacred architecture, which is rooted in the claim that, quote, the sacred needs architecture if it is not to wither, and that similarly, architecture needs the sacred. His meditations include an invitation to move beyond seeing the contemporary age as the age of the decorated shed, an age which Harry sees as content to clothe the body of the building in an aesthetically pleasing exterior, while the artistically more ambitious ambitious would transform the building as a whole into a kind of mega sculpture, allowing the sculptural dress to bend and shape, perhaps smother the architecture beneath. His underlying intent is clearly directed to an acknowledgement that, that what the world needs is not a decoration of a reality from which meanings and values are excluded, but a window to what transcends that reality a window to the sacred that proffers meanings and values. Harry's believes that architecture can create such a portal through a binding back of ascetic creativity to the sacred, a return to that binding measure of responsible freedom which grants weight and substance to human life expressed in architecture. Here, Harry's also employs the metaphor of a veil that, quote, conceals even as it calls attention to what lies beneath, be it face, body, or something sacred. Such a veil does not want to be appreciated for its own sake, but as a boundary and a bond with what remains concealed, a threshold both separating and linking the sacred and the profane, the inner and the outer, the spiritual and the material. Here I'm reminded of St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews in chapter 6, verse 19 through 20. And it's, it seems to me it's another convergence here of language. 
And Paul says, we have this hope, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters the inner shrine behind the veil where Jesus, a forerunner on our behalf, has entered. This paper is the result of a visit to see the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels in October of 2011, just this past fall. Extensive research and study of the building and site beforehand, including video footage of liturgical celebrations, provided arresting and provocative data which coalesced into an impression that the cathedral was not only significant ecclesial architecture, but important urban architecture. Yet the research and the cerebral impression it informed were rendered an inadequate basis for evaluating the cathedral. Both were incapable of capturing its carefully choreographed movement in time and space through forms, volumes, and textures that create a potent, visceral experience of place within and without. Leaving Chinatown behind and walking toward the downtown Los Angeles neighborhood of Bunker Hill in the early morning light, the cathedral appeared as a monumental, weighty, substantive arc of orienting permanence moored, moored to its birth alongside the Hollywood freeway. Something of the early Franciscan mission compounds of Southern California, even something of the medieval, was evoked in the cathedral's scale, material choices, simplicity of forms, and the site's processional character and ordering as a citadel on a hill. Clearly, an alternative interpretation of reality as an enduring measure of reality was on offer for a city perceived as an urban environment in search of a communal identity. The differentiation of this interpretation within the urban context was made all the more poignant by the confrontational character of high school number nine by the office of Kuop Himmelblau in 2008, located across the Hollywood freeway directly opposite the cathedral on the north end of Grand Ave. You can see it right here. And this uh, kind of curly cue uh, uh, element uh, is basically from the air meant to uh, uh, read as the number nine. This paper sets out to examine the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels as a means of explicating Harry's twofold claim that the sacred needs architecture and that architecture needs the sacred. The issue will be approached from a phenomenological reading of the cathedral, not as an object or a phenomenon within the concept of the natural landscape, but in relation to its urban context. In addition to Harry's, the discussion's theoretical framework will be informed by a circle of scholars writing on architecture from a phenomenological point of view including Kenneth Frampton and Christian Norberg Schultz, both of whom looked to Martin Heidegger's influential 1951 le lecture, Building, Dwelling, Thinking, to fashion interpretive frameworks within which to analyze the relationship between architecture and phenomenology, and the writing of German theologian and religious studies scholar Sigurd Bergman. While this exercise will reveal a complex dialogue between the cathedral and a philosophical body of thinking represented by these authors, it will also reveal a convergence of accessible language which can be appropriated by those looking to advance the discourse between the ecclesial and architectural disciplines. To demonstrate this convergence between the ecclesial and architectural disciplines, the following questions will be explored. How does the cathedral place us in both time and space? How does the cathedral manifest the paradox and tension of transcendence and eminence? And finally, how does the cathedral navigate the movement between exteriority and interiority? Through an examination of each question, a theoretical framework will be developed. We will then spend time walking the cathedral precinct to see how the cathedral has the potential to bring this theoretical framework to life for both believer and non-believer, and to affirm Harry's claim that the sacred needs architecture and that architecture needs the sacred. Let us turn to the question of time and space. 
Harry's essay provides the entry point into this phenomenological approach and discussion, which looks to map how sacred architecture, and in particular, the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels, places the human person and community in time and space. His treatment of Lincoln Cathedral asserts that what distinguishes this architecture from its circumscribing architecture is more than just the addition of some aesthetic component or its representational function as a substantial public place of assembly, which was deemed worthy of the community's material investment in the transformation of the structure into a venerable aesthetic object. Lincoln Cathedral in its entirety, which would include the architecture, art, music, liturgy, narrative, ecclesiology, theology, the clergy, the laity, witnesses to that which was valued as most profound and meaning meaningful in life by those who accommodated the city, those who commissioned the patron, and those who designed the building, the architects. According to Harry's, the cathedral as the material object is then seen and experienced as a figure of utopia, an implanted presence proposing an authentic and God-sustained community life in the present and promising eternal life and bliss in the future. Lincoln Cathedral is perceived to embody what Harry's calls figural significance for the community and so is endowed with unique resonance, weight, and substance. Within this context, Harry's likens the experience of the sacred to a vertical which intersects our everyday horizontal lives, disposing individuals and communities to the transcendent in this particular time and place. Mircea Eliada, uh, influential interpretive religious experience employs similar, similar axial terms to describe the intersecting character of the sacred within time and space. Sacred space is interruptive and inherently fecund, pregnant with further interruptions. This interruptive nature reveals an absolute reality and discloses a center, the central axis for all future orientation. Sacred space's interfering character establishes a conduit of communication between the heavenly and earthly realms to establish that this place is distinct from that place. This temple, or sorry, the temple, ep epitomizes an ordered upward momentum that pierces these two planes so that communication with the gods might be maintained. This image of reaching for the heavens is symbolized in the sacred pole, that axis mundi around which a separate world or co cosmos exists and is centered to become a source of reality and a cosmological image, the cosmic pillar. Sacred ritual centered around this axis returns the human person to the primordial time of origins and disposes each person to participation in the cosmos, the ultimate source of existential meaning and value. Here a real world is convoked and uncovered to become knowable and comprehended, a place where the human person experiences a real existence. Sacred space is then experiential. Christianity embraces and embodies in a particular way the geometry described by Harry's and Eliada. This is the point of the incarnation. Div divinity takes on human flesh to be embodied in a unique and historical person so that humanity may be in communion with God, the vertical, and with humanity itself, the horizontal. The person of Christ embodies the balanced tension between the transcendent and the imminent. Here the extraordinary meets and embraces the ordinary. The sacred meets and embraces the profane. And as we sing uh, or hear sung at the Easter Vigil, heaven is wedded to earth. For Catholic Christianity and its liturgy, the mystery of this union in which the human image is, as Paul asserts in his letter to the Colossians, the image of the invisible God, gives new weight and substance, meaning and value to human materiality. Embodied humanity is now holy. Harry's insistence on the permanent union of spirit and matter 
as constitutive of the sacred, that vertical intersecting the horizontal is then anticipated and actualized. By attending to an historical moment of God's divine presence breaking into human history, Catholic sacred space becomes Eliade's cosmolog cosmological, cosmological image. At the same time, Catholicism asserts that all time, space, and space are blessed and suffused with the holiness of the creator God of Genesis and so assumes that the sacred finds expression in a diversity of forms. Catholicism seeks to offer individuals and communities a lifelong immersion and formation in a way of life that not only experiences the transcendent in this particular time and place, but comprehends the world and life itself as inherently sacred. Within this cosmology, described by the architect Aldo Rossi as a total an undifferentiated framework where the idea of space itself is nullified and transcended. Catholicism acknowledges and affirms the human need for ritual environments which constitute a constellation of what uh, Rossi refers to as singular points of intense encounter with the sacred. Catholicism orders these singularities, according to Rossi, through its liturgy to create built forms which, in the very act of being constituted, are transcended and go beyond the functions which they must serve to attend to the divine's presence or eminence within the created order. Our Lady of the Angels Cathedral is such a singularity. It is constructed as a unified space, a totality, which does not feel fragmented despite its scale. The visitor is invited into a continual progression of elevational changes of ascent and descent throughout the site. I'm just going to quickly walk you through. You're walking down the sidewalk. Here under the cross is where we enter off the street. When we walk up, there are ramps or these uh, grand staircases. And as we approach the, the main doors, And one of the one of two ambulatories, and this is a reverse. Or sorry, this is we're headed now towards uh, the cathedral uh, uh, nave, and that's looking back uh, along that same corridor. And then uh, we then move into uh, the central volume, down the central aisle towards the altar. And then back up to the ambulatories and out into the plaza. So this is another of the ambulatories, and then we're back out into this large plaza to descend back to the street level or parking and public transit levels. Maneo exercises great subtlety here. The rhythmic asymmetry of the concrete piers in the nave and the use of alabaster glazing with its dance of light and shadow revealing a myriad of textures, offer an experience of kinetic and sensory space. At times the concrete reads as a warm wood veneer, and other times like suede, you just you really want to go up and touch it. An asymmetrical rhythm is also realized in the linear detailing of the cathedral ceiling and its many intersecting angles of cedar planks on edge, which reads like a tented roof to evoke that tent of meeting housing the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat referred to in the book of Exodus chapter 31. The cathedral with its breadth of sensory experience frames a total body experience where, as Romano Guardini claims, an intimation of God's presence can blossom forth. So let us turn now to the question of transcendence and imminence. Catholic liturgy sheltered and supported by built forms or sacred architecture transcends time as it invokes the future, eternal life with God, by bringing the past, God's saving entry into human history and the person of Jesus Christ, into the present, communion with the real presence of Christ. Cardinal Ratzinger, now Pope Benedict, describes this act of invocation 
A curtain of temporality is raised and we are allowed a glimpse into the inner life of the world of God. In this way, Catholic sacred space frames the gathering of the individual and Christian community throughout time as a horizontal movement forward to encounter the vertical movement of God downward. Catholic liturgical space and its marking of time as a union of material and spirit is then experienced as Harry's intersection or Eliade's interruption of this place with transcended space and time to become sacred space. Harry's looks to Walter Benjamin's work, the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, to describe and to define the experience of the sacred in architecture as that which necessarily transcends our ability to produce or reproduce it. <clears throat> Reproduction is understood here to be a rending of architecture from its historical context and rootedness in the fabric of tradition, and thus to destroy the aura of a work of art. This forms the crux of Harry's twofold claim that the sacred needs architecture and that similarly, architecture needs the sacred. While the common reference point or faith narrative around which past individual lives were formed and sustained as an ongoing community can no longer be assumed, the substitution of the ascetic for the sacred within the decorated sheds of contemporary architecture is incapable of creating a contemporary sacred architecture. Ascetic appeal defined architecturally here as a world within the world, complete, integral, whole, and free of contradiction is not enough. For such an architectural modus operandi knows nothing of sacred transcendence and is opposed to every contextualism. An aura of transcendence is then constitutive of authentic sacred architecture. Buildings which invite cloning are buildings which lack a certain rootedness in particular contexts appear ready to travel, and as such are what the French anthropologist Marc Auger referred to as non-places that are everywhere and nowhere. Those contexts where people spend increasing amounts of time, supermarkets and shopping malls, airports, hotels and motorways, in front of the television or sitting at a computer. For Harry's, buildings with such weakened identities compromise their capacity to provide more than physical shelter, as necessary as that is. Their mobile character is antithetical to place-establishing architecture, which is to say that such architecture is incapable of what he calls spiritual shelter. Such buildings reflect and implicate modern spirituality itself, however defined, with its requisite spiritual mobility and indifference to transcendent experience. Such mobility and indifference sever the critical link between architecture and the sacred. This rupture suggests what Harry's refers to as a fallout of history and a loss of place for contemporary architecture. Given contemporary culture's attachment to the promises of the Enlightenment, which are seemingly fulfilled and driven by the triumph of technology, where human reason alone is the final arbiter of reality and meaning, and which presupposes to reproduce reality back into our concrete lives. Harry's notes that it should come as no surprise that this reality is increasingly experienced as devoid of transcendence and lacking any place for the sacred. The substitution of the banal for the sacred within modern culture is inherently ironic for Harry's. Contemporary life seems to have need of what it has inherited to decorate a life that seems impoverished without such embellishments, all the while displacing the sacred's aura for ascetic appeal, beautiful, or just interesting masks. Charles Jenks, an architectural theorist, concur concurs with this assessment when he describes the pervasive distrust and indifference towards all meta narratives, especially the perceived irrelevance of religious belief as a shared reference point for society. 
employing a religious idiom, he identifies this skepticism as the driver of a contemporary culture turned in on itself, where clothes are worshipped, scantily clad celebrities are emulated today almost like saints, and money is the only universal in which a global culture believes. Unlike the aura of the saint and the trace of sanctity about the, the icon, these commodities are merely icons of the moment. One consequence of the displacement described by Harry's is what the architect and critic Edwin Heathcote characterizes as a loss of visual literacy. This is more than simply a stifled ability to read art, but more importantly for sacred architecture, includes a lost proficiency with reading meaning in buildings. Contemporary culture's memory and its memories of meaning are impoverished and further compromised as the non-place described by Auger increasingly directs the ordering of individual and communal living. Yet Harry's architecture is place-establishing architecture that looks to provide not only physical and functional shelter, but soul shelter. Sacred architecture is not a material housing of religious activity where an overemphasis on the worshiping community's participation in the liturgy renders the religious building as a meaningless envelope, nor is such architecture meant to manifest a definitive containment of the sacred. This is holistic architecture, acknowledging, responding, and attending to body, mind, and soul. Sigurd Bergman affirms and expands this role with his characterization of sacred architecture as a living space for the art of surviving. Here, the human body is embraced through communication on multiple levels with all the senses. And the spatial dimension of the church's liturgy, which creates environments for physical and spiritual movement, the result is an architectural wholeness, understood as a process of becoming between body and spirit, where the inner spaces of those gathered expand sacred architecture's meaning to the whole of creation. To achieve this expansion, Bergman notes that such architecture is necessarily characterized by a very high degree of memor memorability, which ensures that the experience of its interior space is sustained within the everyday life of experience outside of it. The sacred then becomes not only a binding measure, which offers weight and substance to architecture's role as a bearer of meaning and values, but a countercultural measure which asserts that the spiritual and the material of architecture are not in opposition, but interplay for the growing together of everything into one common space. Bergman goes on to note that clear visibility within the cityscape allows such architecture to sustain memory of the built form. The Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels commanding presence next to the Hollywood Freeway is a case in point. Let us now turn to the question of exteriority and interiority. The cathedral's massive concrete cross, what Maneo identified as the Christian symbol, and referred to as a suspended reredos, embodies such a unifying and binding measure of humanity's freedom. The cross, which entered the, the cathedral's east end along a 45 degree descent oriented to the altar, is yet another of Harry's intersections where the binary nature of interior and exterior is effectively transcended. The cross of the interior space is then projected out through the structure to the exterior to assert that the interiority of the spiritual life and the exteriority of everyday life are not fragmented experiences, but are a seamless reality. 
The exterior cross, oops, I've jumped ahead. The exterior cross becomes a focal point on the east facade to create a rare doors for larger liturgical celebrations and to orient the visitor within the plaza. Harry's binary assessment noted above that moderns have fallen out of time and place while sacred architecture is place establishing architecture finds additional support in Kenneth Frampton's discussion of the phenomenon of universal placelessness. Frampton looks to Martin Heidegger's definition of boundary, which is not where something stops, but as the Greeks recognized, the boundary is that from which something begins its presencing. Resisting this phenomenon of universal placelessness is predicated upon a defined or bounded domain, which in its public manifestation is what he calls the bounded place form that empowers the built form. Christian Norbuk Schultz helps to expand Frampton's concretizing of this presencing by employing Heidegger's concept of dwelling to describe architecture as a means for humanity to establish an existential foothold, where dwelling in an existential sense is the purpose of architecture, where architecture is a means to visualize the spirit of the place, or genius loci, where to create meaningful spaces is to help humanity to dwell. Raphael Mineo identifies this ordering as an ability to accommodate the multiple presences inherent in buildings, and which ought to be the means by which the architect condenses disparity into the single self-supported presence of buildings. Norberg Schultz asserts that humanity's, humanity experiences its environment as meaningful when it can orient itself within its environment. While the existential dimension is manifested in history, this dimension's meanings transcend the, tr the historical situation and allow human history to be a bearer of meaning to the extent that it represents new concretiza concretizations of the existential dimension. Norbrook Schultz defines his existential dimension in terms of place, where place represents architecture's share and truth, and the concretization of humanity's dwelling, both of which inform humanity's identity. Human identity, then, is contingent upon belonging to places. This identity is defined within what he refers to as objects of identification, or concrete environmental properties. Norbrook Schultz stresses the importance of spatially structuring the human environment and asserts that such an environment must consist of concrete objects of identification. When the human person experiences the environment as meaningful, she or he feels at home because the environment is accessible. If cities have the capacity to enable place identity, as Philip, Philip Sheldrake claims, then the monumentality of the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels and its plaza as an ordered urban sacred precinct substantiates such an urban faculty within a city lacking a center and transitioning from a place of stubborn individualism to one that is struggling to find its communal, communal identity. I have already provided examples of how the cathedral has the potential to bring the theoretical framework discussed to life. Now I'd like to spend time, uh, the time remaining, walking the cathedral precinct to demonstrate its potential and beauty. The cathedral precinct reads as one large stage where processional movement immerses and choreographs visitors in the measured act of an individual and communal earthly pilgrimage en route to an encounter with the divine. The passage of time is mapped and marked within this procession to become a sub subliminal communication within the embodied memories of the visitor 
who has become an actor within the sacred human drama of pilgrimage. The visitor is oriented, and so the potential meanings on offer within this place are accessible. Norbert Schultz claims that this is the point at which architecture comes into being and concretizes the genius loci, when a total environment is made visible when a site is transformed into a place to uncover the meanings potentially present in the given environment. Maneo clearly understood the capacity of this architecture to allow individuals to bring their interpretation and imagination and that of the community's faith tradition to the building, thereby endowing the architecture with the power to be what he calls a new vessel for sacred experience. He recognized immediately the resisting potential described by Frampton, inherent to the site selected for the cathedral, its location on the cultural axis of Grand Avenue, its commanding physical setting over the downtown core, its excellent visibility, especially from the Hollywood freeway. It's easy accessibility within the city by foot, car, and public transit. It's autonomous character which, while woven into the downtown, was not absorbed by the cultural and civic center of the city. The scale of the complex and its ordering along the lines of the early Franciscan mission compounds of Southern California required that the cathedral not be situated within the sacred precinct as a singular design element. Having located the cathedral at the west end, which is also the site's highest point, allows it to dominate the site while accommodating an expansive and open two-level plaza. The plaza creates an intentional transitional space which enables parishioners to navigate and attend to the space between everyday city life and the cathedral interior. The result, the bounded place form. In this case, a former downtown parking lot empowered the built form of the cathedral and its plaza to become a presencing public space, a sanctuary of refuge from what Maneo called the solitude of the individual that prevails in the American city. Our Lady of the Angels Cathedral, as embodied sacred architecture, is then a countercultural response by the Catholic community of Los Angeles to the assumptions of the Enlightenment. It is an intentional architectural assertion that the secret of authentic originality is predicated on a return to one's origin, which is God. The author of life, who as Pope Benedict says, is the true measure of humanity. It offers the city a transcendent image, what Benedict refers to as a remembrance in visible form, and a binding measure of weight and substance that is represented within the here and now to embody what is not only perceived, but experienced to be of figural significance. The cathedral is also a testimony to the human capacity within this city to create an urban spiritual scenography which gathers and orients citizens and visitors to an encounter with the transcendent and eminent one who is truth and beauty itself. It offers the city a singular embodiment of the centuries-old continuum of Christian sacred space and an architectural expression of meanings and values which conform to the measure of the universe, a binding measure which does not undermine but expands human freedom to a new horizon. The Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels, designed to last for 500 years, provides the spatial structure to create potential meaning and a transcendent environment. The act of anointing and consecrating the cathedral with fragrant olive oil during the rite of dedication ritually marks it as a weighted and substantive space. New meaning and value is imparted to mundane materiality 
12 crosses hand rendered with blessed olive oil actualize this anointing throughout the cathedral interior. They have been absorbed in the, into the concrete walls and remain forever visible as traces of sacred markings with a lingering aura. Whoops. They architecturally embody the permanent union of spirit and matter and so are empowered spiritually and physically to witness to the intrinsic power of space and also of cosmic space which surrounds us and gives us life. The act of ringing the bells located atop Shepherd's Gate and the Campanile extends the walls of the cathedral to establish an acoustical place and becomes a temporal icon of sound within the city. And I'm reminded just now of um, Archbishop Demetrius, who is the head of the Greek Orthodox Church uh, in the U.S., and uh, he was visiting our school in November, and he made reference to the Orthodox tradition's understanding of bells as singing icons. Oops, there they are again. The Carillon Wall contains 36 stationary bells programmed to ring hymns throughout the day. I guess I should be back here, sorry. Uh, the Carillon Wall contains 36 stationary bells programmed to ring hymns throughout the day and to call people to liturgical celebrations. The largest of these bells bears the following inscription. Ring out the darkness of the land. Ring in the Christ that is to be. Ring in the valiant man and free the larger heart, the kindlier hand. The Cathedral Campanile is 150 feet high and holds 18 bells, which can be heard four miles away. Such hallowing and bell ringing are but two sensory examples of the cathedral's particular presencing, and by extension, the concretized structuring of that presence in relationship to the neighborhood and the urban fabric of the city. Richard Vosco, a liturgical design consultant and priest, describes sacred architecture as a resonator, which replays the collective memory of a faith tradition. This is especially true for the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels as the mother church of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, which serves as a model of liturgical life, including its form and space, for all the churches of the Archdiocese. Mineo's Cathedral makes for a thoughtful and evocative design solution. The plaza reinforces a preparatory and transitional space before the visitor must make a decision to enter the cathedral. The brilliance of Mineo's processional programming, both exterior and interior, and his inversion of the basilica plan is realized as one processes forward along the side ambulatories. So I'm just gonna walk you through again. The arrow down here is where we enter off the street and you come along the ambulatory uh, you saw photos of that earlier. You turn into the, the uh, cathedral proper, the nave, and then you have to turn again if you want to enter into the nave. And the same holds true alternatively on the other ambulatory, same process. And then we turn back into the cathedral's interpretation of reality and the faith embodied in this place towards the altar. The individual who has left the world behind is then reoriented back to that world to ponder its present state and to imagine how things might be through the lens of the sacred. The cathedral supports and affects an intentional, sensorial, and disciplined remembering as it embeds memory through the ritual and gestural choreography of the body in time and space. Processing, touching, singing, bowing, blessing, baptizing, anointing, kneeling, incensing, eating, and commissioning. The sensory resonance of the cathedral, its aura, lingers long after what the intellect has forgotten. 
The cathedral offers the city something more profound than another reinforcement of ordered public life, or even a centerpiece for revitalization of the historic core of the city. The cathedral manifests a commitment to cultivating the site by transforming a former parking lot located along the Hollywood Freeway, formerly the historic El Camino Real, or California Mission Trail, into a publicly accessed sacred compound and reclaims the holiness of all creation, as it were. It is a singular architectural eruption of the cosmos towards God. It is a threshold which both demarcates and unites the sacred and the profane, and a veil which does not seek to be appreciated for its own sake, but is a boundary and a bond with what remains concealed. It is substantive architecture that has grown out of spiritual and physical needs, which speaks to and embraces human living and its most profound attendant questions about meaning at the subjective and objective levels to become a microcosm of the cosmos. It is also a sensory religious interpretation of reality and an interpretive context. An urban text, if you like, offered as a spiritual and urban resource. Despite the potential for the dismissal of or indifference to the cathedral's interpretation, it remains an interpretation nonetheless, one that is persistent and continues to resonate with meaning for a multitude of Angelinos. The cathedral provides for many an accessible language which advances the discourse between the ecclesial and architectural disciplines. Contemporary culture risks the impoverishment of its memory and its experience of meaning when it fails to at least entertain this interpretation like it would any other. It would appear that Harry's title, Untimely Meditations on the Need for Sacred Architecture, is a misnomer. If anything, his meditations are timely. The sacred needs architecture, and architecture needs the sacred. Thank you. Sure. Um, so we're just going to open it up to questions if uh, people have any. We have a couple of microphones on the side and if it's possible to make your way there that would be um, helpful for the recording. Does anyone have anything they'd like to... Oh, come on. <laughs> Without the help of a microphone, <laughs> could you tell Sorry. us what the sound of the interior of that building was to you? The sound? Yeah. Um, maybe, let, let me approach it this way. I, uh, as I mentioned, was familiar with the building and for many years I've wanted to, to go visit because uh, I think under Carlo Mahoney, liturgy there has, uh, is done well. And so I, you know, I had a sense of the, the building. I'd watched videos and found uh, some of those liturgies quite moving. In fact, the installation of the new archbishop, I think 18 months ago, I found quite a moving. And this was just watching on the laptop. So I walked across, go into this building, and I immediately had this emotional response to the space. Um, and I was caught off guard by that, it was taken by surprise. And it, there's a certain uh, simplicity about that space. It's massive, it's a massive space, and yet it feels intimate. Um, and the material choices and uh, Mineo's masterly treatment uh, of light with the alabaster, um, it was just something mystical going on in that space. and. Um, there are acoustical problems with the space that have been, um, and I haven't shown you, and we can maybe take a look at that. Maybe I'll just do that uh, quickly. Um, I'm going to come back to these because I, 
don't want us to. Sorry, I'm just going to show you these uh, tapestries that, uh, as you enter into the space nave proper, these huge 30 foot tapestries are accompanying you, the communion of saints. And um, so they were, uh, uh, it's a soft material and these hard shells, so it was a, uh, an answer, a solution to this acoustical problem that uh, you'll hear comments by performers uh, using the space outside of liturgies and whatnot. But it's, um, even the sound in there, I found it kind of, it wasn't an overwhelming or I didn't feel distant, it's something very intimate about the space, even on a, an oral level. Uh, I don't know if that... That's what, that's what I wanted to know yeah. about the sound in the space. Yeah. Um, I just want to point out while we're here that um, you'll notice these four young youths here, and out of the over 120 saints that are rendered on both sides of the nave, these four are left unnamed on purpose um, and identified as young uh, teenagers, a high-risk group, and they represent obviously African-American, Caucasian, Hispanic, and Asian. Um, so there's some real thoughtfulness that has gone into uh, some of the appointments and whatnot. I think some of the, the uh, detailing is a little problematic, but there was a concerted effort uh, to have a cross-section of artists local uh, as much as possible in the appointments of the space. Other questions? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, professor, could you just <laughs> ask me, uh, there is some, something dedicated to Our Lady of Guadalupe, isn't there? And I wondered if you could speak to that, and was it in the original plan, or was it added later? And um, I'm just gonna, it'll be easier to show you on the plan, I'm sorry. Oops. So, there is a shrine on the exterior to Our Lady of Guadalupe right here. And um, uh, I think that there's been an intentional uh, choice to put it outside because the devotion is so strong amongst the Hispanic community in LA. I mean, when I was there, uh, there must have been 300 people around. Uh, you know, this was like, I spent the whole day, I was there at four liturgies on a Sunday. So eight o'clock, 10, noon, seven o'clock, and I was there for baptisms in the afternoon. And this place is just pulsating with life. And it's, you know, you walk around the downtown at that, on a Sunday, it's dead. But this place is just alive with energy and piety and families picnicking and whatnot. They have a, a bookstore uh, in this area here and there's a little cafe. And, but you've really got a wonderful precinct in the heart of the city. And what I wanted to show here was, um, so when you come in along the ambulatories uh, on either side, so we're coming in on um, uh, I guess, sorry, the east, uh, sorry, the south side. As you process along, this is the brilliance of this inversion of the basilica plan. You'll see by these green arrows, there are these little apertures that give you a glimpse as you're walking along into the nave. But what's wonderful about it is a liturgy can be going on here, and you have pilgrims from all over the archdiocese, be the architectural. Uh, tourists or pilgrims, whatever. So you don't have this interruptive nature. And in fact, when uh, before the building was designed, Cardinal Mahoney took Maneo and they went through Spain and France into cathedrals. And Mahoney would say, "You see what's happening in here in these traditional cathedrals where you have. I mean, you've many of you have been there. You've been at a liturgy, and there are thousands of people moving in and out, and it's a bit frenetic and chaotic." And the Cardinal said, I don't want this happening. This is exactly what I don't want happening in the cathedral. And this was, I think, the brilliance of Mineo's solution is he's isolated these processional ambulatories but gives you these glimpses, these teasers, if you like, into the space itself. Um, and so this is exactly what I'm talking about. You walk along the end and you just get this narrow aperture right beside one of ten shrines that uh, are on either side of the ambulatory. And there's 
um, devotional uh, chapel there. And this beautiful uh, natural light that washes down uh, from above. Um, I'm just going to take some liberties here too. The other thing that um, I don't know if any of you have had any experience with uh, immersion baptisms, but it's alive and well in the Catholic tradition. It's, it's more and more churches, cathedrals are returning to that. And uh, I was there, there were about 20 uh, children, toddlers, infants, whatnot, with their families, and tattoos and piercings, and it's just this real cross-section of life in that city. And the priest never once had to say, be quiet, or no, let's focus here, or whatever. These people got it. In, you couldn't do a year of catechesis and achieve what this font did. The priest has the child, brings the parents, take your shoes and socks off, roll up the pants. Godparents, you're in here as well. And the five of them have that child. And they go and baptize them in, in that water. I had te tears running my, my eyes because I've been involved in catechesis. And I thought, those people will have a sensory memory that you cannot replicate in a baptism that takes place in a bird bath. It's, it's just, you know, the impoverishment of our own liturgical symbols is really sad. We have a wonderful treasury and we minimalize our symbols. God is prodigal with his symbols, his images, his metaphors. It's not rationed out. And this is a perfect example of, uh, you, can, you can see here the four corners allow people to come in and do the hand dipping and whatnot. But more importantly, I think, it allows for this full sensory experience of what it means to be enfolded in God's grace. And we do that in a concrete, tactile way, not in some metaphorical language, as beautiful as that is. Um, and I just want to, I mean, the thing that got me, these people got it. You didn't need any catechesis or rubrics or a narrative. Okay, now we're going to do this, and now we're going to light the candle and whatever. No, the ritual was able to speak for itself in the ritual action. Um, the other amazing dynamic that takes place in this space, this is after each of those masses, after the baptisms. So 8 o'clock mass, 1,000 people. 10 o'clock, 3,000. Noon, 3,500 people. 7 o'clock, 3,000 people. Before Mass begins, but especially directly after Eucharist and people have dismissed, people charge this cross. It's life-size, but it's not this triumphal cross. It's accessible. And the patina from the knees down, I mean, it is gleaming from people touching this. Uh, so it's, it's almost like Good Friday veneration after every liturgy. But it's uh, the other thing that I, I, there's people lining up. I'm not making this up. Uh, the other thing that I found, um, I, I'll just show you. You talk about big symbols. This is an Easter fire. This isn't some wimpy little, you know, this is Christ the light, right? Uh, and there's a, that's a Paschal candle, not a birthday candle. Um, those are the tapestries. But I just wanted to... Um, Go back. Sorry. One other important thing when we hear all this language about um, recovering the mystery, uh, you know, the reform of the reform, and all of that uh, talk, which, you know, sometimes can get quite heated uh, and I think quite dismissive. Here, yeah, was that a liturgy? There are 2,500 people, and they go, they want to get to that cross to venerate it. Now, there's no communion rail, there's nothing. But those people understood with these four simple visual markers that this area here we treat with particular reverence. And that was done without a communion rail or an announcement or ropes or saying or signage that says, you know, restricted access or whatnot. They got it. I'm talking hundreds of people respectfully moving around that without a single prompt. People get it when the space, I think, is articulated well. I found that an incredibly poignant moment when we talk about 
we make these gross generalizations about how people have lost a sense of mystery and whatnot in contemporary um, uh, liturgy, when it's celebrated well. And I just want to make one other point before I put you all to sleep. It doesn't matter how wonderful this space is. Um, I was at a cathedral in uh, Seattle in January doing for another project, doing a case study on St. James Cathedral, which if you're ever in Seattle, go. It's an amazing liturgical space. It's an old, um, you know, early 20th century building that has been well thought out and, and reordered. But even in that space, it doesn't matter how wonderful it is if you don't have kind of the pastoral component that's supporting and reinforcing what architecturally is there. And it, you can, um, what, I, what strikes me here or at uh, the one in, in Seattle was, so this was an eight o'clock, eight o'clock Sunday morning, thousand people, and they had 32 Eucharistic ministers. 32! You know, that's a, now, and, you know, they're as, they're as strapped as any other diocese in terms of personnel. But they've made a commitment to educating lay people to carry out their baptismal calling. So that there's this incredible witness going on liturgically to that assembly. So, uh, as I say, it, it doesn't matter how wonderful the space is, is if you don't have a liturgical... Uh, sensibility and a willingness to at least explore the potential within space and how we move through space. Uh, you know, too often I think in our liturgy, you can tell people aren't comfortable moving. You know, and yet that's part of our liturgy. It's in our bones, our liturgical bones, our, our Catholic heritage. If you look back through history, that was the glory of uh, Catholic liturgy, Orthodox liturgy. And it's it's possible even within a space that gets dismissed as some kind of concrete cube. So, enough said. <laughs> Any final questions? One? Okay, to give our uh, official thank you. Went on too long. Yeah, <laughs> not at all. Um, I'd like to invite up our Vice President and Academic Dean, Jim Frank. Michael, thank you for joining us this evening uh, to show us Los Angeles beyond Hollywood. And uh, over discussion this evening, yes, Michael has met Matt Damon, uh, <laughs> who was the star of, of Goodwill Hunting, uh, a, a, a movie he did work on, on the set design. We're gathered here in some very humble space this evening, but about 50 years ago, the, uh, the Sisters of Notre Dame would have designed this space with the same, I think, uh, depth of visioning as, as probably went into the, uh, the, the uh, design of Our Lady of, uh, of the Angels Cathedral. And I think they would be delighted to know that you're with us this evening to talk about the, uh, the thought and the visioning that goes into the design of sacred space and how important it is to, uh, to our spirituality. So thank you for being with us this evening. So I hope that you'll join us for some refreshments. I know that we are in a slightly different space tonight, but just outside the uh, hallway here in the lobby area, there's our usual... Um, pamphlets and information and ability to uh, donate to the lecture series if you wish. And then uh, the next door that's open on your left, uh, coffee, tea, refreshment. So please uh, mill about and join us and hopefully Michael will uh, stick around for a few more minutes and if you want to have any uh, more informal conversation. And I hope to see you back uh, next Friday, which will be our next lecture. Um, it's Kathleen Mass Weigert. Uh, and uh, following that, the following Friday will be uh, the last lecture here and then in April um, we'll be at St. Mary's as usual. Uh, the entire lecture series will, um, this podcast will be up on our website and the, uh, the rest of the season is up on the website. So www.sju.ca and follow the links for the lecture series. Um, 
And I look forward to seeing you all over at refreshments. Thanks again for coming and see you next Friday.